Can you hear me? I cannot hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, my audio was off. Nice to meet you, Benu. Nice to meet you. How are you? I'm good. Let me let me pull up a few things. Just a sec. Sure. I uh, I just had uh, my wife suddenly had a back pain that felt really bad. It wasn't kind of a back pain. It was something else. So we were weirded out. So we just oh. came back from the hospital. But luckily, it's a sprained muscle and there's nothing oh. serious. Okay. Good to hear. It's yeah, very painful, the strained muscle. It, it, it's <laughs> it, it, can, it can be painful. This one was one of the nice painful ones. Um, but it's, uh, so it's good to know that it will be better. Yeah. Um, you're comfortable with the live stream? Yeah, why not? Cool. Let me throw it on there. YouTube or GitLab unfiltered. Live. Yeah, so um, we're here today. Uh, I'm Sid. I'm the co-founder uh, and CEO at GitLab. Banu, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Banu Antal. I'm a leadership psychologist and an executive coach. And I work with startup co-founders, manage conflict, um, and create synergistic relationships. And today I want to talk to you about your co-founder relationships a little bit. Very cool. Yeah, we uh, met at, uh, I think you uh, you noticed I was at AmmoConf uh, earlier this year. You got in touch and uh, let's uh, let's talk about that. I'll, I'll have you ask the questions, I guess. Awesome. Yeah, I was just curious about your story, um, the founder team story. I think uh, your co-founder, Dimitri, and how did you guys meet? Yeah, so... Um, Dimitri started GitLab um, by himself while he was working at a company and uh, over a year 300 people joined the effort and contributed code. I only saw it a year later. I saw it was a Hacker News post, someone posted it and I thought it makes so much sense that something that uh, I as a developer used to collaborate is something I can contribute back to. Everything I used was open source and this made sense too. So. Um, but you didn't know him personally. I did not know him. So what I did is um, I said, look, I'm, I can see that you can run GitLab yourself, but nobody had GitLab as a service. So I started GitLab.com. And I sent him an email like, hey, I'm starting GitLab.com. I hope you, you don't mind. Like, you're not going to get anything, but I, I hope you're okay with it. It's, it's open source. And I figured I, I didn't need his permission. He sent a very polite email back, like, no, it's open source. You go for it. And I'm so glad you're making GitLab more popular, which is very like open-minded. Like you, 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 you could have a lot of people that, that would say something else. And to sketch the situation, he was living in the Ukraine as he is now, but like his house uh, didn't have streaming water at the time. Like he was, he was not making an insane amount of money uh, enough to live on, but, but, but it was basic. Um, I didn't have a ton of money either. Uh, I ended up putting 100K in it, but I had to keep working uh, full-time in order to pay someone to work on GitLab. So I kept working full-time as a consultant and I paid Marin, who lived in Serbia, to work on GitLab. I was living in the Netherlands, so three, three countries quite far apart from each other. Uh, and for a year that continued until he tweeted, Dimitri tweeted out to the entire world, I want to work on GitLab full-time. Uh, quite 
unusual to like post a 30 entire world, like he was employed and everything. Um, I saw that. And by that time, I've gotten a couple of co um, big companies that said, we're running GitLab. Can you add some features to it? And I was like, well, we're, we're kind of running GitLab.com. We're not, we're also kind of figuring that out. We weren't that good. Um, but when I saw that, I was like, hey, I can pay Dimitri and then we can start making those features. So I sent him an email like, hey, I saw your tweet. Like, how much <laughs> do you want to earn? Um, to work full-time on GitLab and he named a number and I went to the local Western Union uh, money office. And when I said I wanted to wire money from the Netherlands to the Ukraine, they were like, do you know this person or is this someone you met over the internet? <laughs> so they were quite skeptical because a lot of scams going on. And at that point, my mental image of Dimitri was like, uh, a pink mob boss because that was his avatar everywhere. It's like a GTA uh, character. And I've never seen a picture of him. I've, it's really you hard. You didn't know how he looked like. No, I didn't even know what he looked like. Like after, after that, I really asked for a picture. I got a picture with him with sunglasses on. Like he was quite, <laughs> he liked his privacy. Character, yeah. So, um, at a certain point, we were working together, I think for, for a couple of months, we were like, we should get together. And we had the perfect venue. There would be a Rails conference in uh, Poland, in Krakow. Um, so we got an Airbnb there, and we would uh, be there a couple of hours ahead of him. It was his first time traveling internationally. And um, we had a bit of a problem because the Airbnb, uh, it didn't have good water. So they switched us to uh, another place. And I left a voicemail on his phone, like, hey, they switched us, this is the new address. So he arrives at the airport, he checks his uh, voicemail, but his credit runs out for his mobile phone because he was had a prepaid phone. Um, he checks his email via the free Wi-Fi, but there was no email. And he proceeds to go to the place. And then the place is like closed. There's nobody there, not a sign, not a thing. And he, he, he like panics. He's like, whoa, I'm finally supposed to meet these people. And like, they don't show up. Like, what am I going to do now? So he heals, he, he starts walking, he heals down in a taxi and tells the driver to like, bring me to a hotel. But um, the driver doesn't know what a hotel is, um, speaks only Polish. Uh, so they hail down like a pedestrian who explains to the driver what a hotel is, brings him to a hotel. He checks in, uh, calms down a bit, checks, checks his email. By that time, he has a couple of emails from us. We're actually in cars driving around the city trying to find the guy because like, why didn't he show up? We know his flight landed. Uh, so we get in touch and I think Martin and Karen, uh, their car got there first. Karen waits outside in a taxi. By that time, it's kind of late at night. And Martin goes in like, oh, we finally found you, come. And he's like, what, come? Like, I'm finally here. I'm finally safe. I don't want to come. Like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm done for now. So actually, it takes like 15 minutes. I'm like, we got beer and pizza. It's for real. It's all okay. And he, he, he joins them. And, and that's, that's how we met, first met in real life. Um, well, that's the story. <laughs> yeah. And we proceed to have a great couple of days doing a lot of uh, sightseeing in Krakow and it was a great conference. And did you start working on it full time as well? Uh, at some point. Um, not initially. Yeah, not initially. Okay. Did he continue living there and then you moved to the United States? Yeah, he continued oh. living there. Um, at a certain point he lives in Kharkov, which is a hundred kilometers from the war zone in the Ukraine. So at a certain time, it got a bit too dangerous there. Oh. So he lived in uh, Utrecht, my hometown for a year. We missed each other by a week because at that time I was emigrating to uh, the US. Oh. So in 2015, I moved to the US. He lived in Utrecht for two years. Now it's a bit more quiet there. So he moved back. Um, so you always had a remote relationship, co yeah. relationship. Yeah. And actually, our entire company is remote. We're an all remote company, 460 people in 47 countries. And it was like that from the first day? Yep. Build it up that way. Awesome. So 
how was your relationship? Like, how did you build a relationship remotely working on, you know, um, how did you, you know, manage work and also the conflict? When you're, yeah. Is it, do you think it's an advantage or a disadvantage? I think it doesn't matter that much. I think you do the same things. You got to make sure there's regular communication. So to this day, we call every single week. Uh, make sure that when there's something important, he gets like a heads up. He, he doesn't feel in the misinformed or like, I, I think surprises are like really bad. Um, so you want to make sure there's, there's never surprises. If something is important and you're thinking about it, that you, you give him a heads up and uh, yeah, a regular cadence of communication. Yeah. How would you describe your relationship? Yeah, um, it's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think the most important thing is that we're co-founders. We, we have started this and we want to um, bring this to a good end uh, together. Um, at a certain point uh, during Y Combinator, we said ahead of time, we're not going to raise external money because the odds of being successful decrease of a successful outcome. Of course, the, the average the median out while the median outcome goes down, the average outcome goes up. Like it can be very big. Um, and um, at the end we decided to do it. And, and, but we, we, he said, look, my commitment is for 10 years. So because we wanted to kind of bring it to a conclusion together, we said, okay, well um, let's aim for uh, becoming a public company in 2020. So that in 2021, when it's 10 years for Dimitri, we have done that. We have achieved that kind of milestone together. Mm. And we're, we're still on track for that. We actually put a date on it recently. And uh, so then you, you kind of have a shared understanding of like the, the values in the company, like we're very result oriented, we're efficient. Um, we like to iterate and we like to use boring solutions. A lot of the values are, are things that we shared together. And we had a, we, our thinking evolved together. At a certain point, um, we, we went from being uh, basically an alternative to GitHub to being a single application for the entire DevOps lifecycle, a, a lot broader scope. Our scope is kind of grown tenfold over time, and that wasn't intuitive. Um, and that started with uh, with him saying, I never, I want to use, I, I'm, well, he didn't even say anything. He just made his own uh, CI solution, a continuous integration solution, a testing framework. And uh, I kind of like, we never talked about it. I kind of let it slide. Like he can do whatever he wants. He's, he's a co-founder. And so far he's, his, his hunches pay off. Um, and uh, at a certain point, someone contributed to that and then joined the company and they said like, let's integrate the two products. And first Dimitri told him he was wrong. And then they came to me together and I told them they were wrong and we ended up doing it. And it was the best thing that ever happened. It turned out that a single application that does multiple things is a way better user experience. So we, we kind of changed that paradigm together and then we doubled down on it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, we're co-founders. Um, we're also, there's a hierarchical relationship between us now. He's, um, I'm a C, the CEO and he's a fellow. A fellow is kind of a, a parallel career track in engineering. And it's equiv would be equivalent to like a VP of engineering, except the, the person is an individual contributor. Mm, okay. So. And, and, and last, I don't want to forget, I've, I, I also consider us friends. Um, We've, we've, we've done adventures together. We will always like to like hang out together and uh, have a drink, share a drink. That's good. So you still come together frequently? Like how many times a year would you say that you would meet in person? Yeah, not, not a lot. Um, we had our first headquarter in San Francisco in Soma and he was, he thought it was such a, it's, it's, it, was, it was a pretty nasty part of San Francisco, so I really didn't like to come there. And we now moved to a different part, but it was kind of interesting that a person close to a war zone was kind of scared by... <laughs> so it, it, you didn't like Soma? It, well, it was the corner in Soma with the most police reports found. Uh, 
it, it was it wasn't it wasn't great um and uh, he he doesn't like long flights so it's harder to come to to get together and that's 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 unfortunate uh but uh, we try to try to see each other at least once a year yeah, that's great and how do you guys manage conflict when you're in conflict what would you say if you're ways of dealing with conflict your way and his way and how does it fit yeah we've had very little conflict i'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you a bit um, that's great why was it disappointing it's it's a, makes you good examples what do you think is helping you not to have that much conflict then yeah um hey, i already mentioned like the heads up like no surprises if you know something is going to be contentious talk about it up front um Talk through all the options, put all the information on the table. Um, have people, you don't want to have like, this is the answer and just handed that to a, pers to a person. It's like, this is the problem. And, and I looked at it these ways and these are the options. And I think we should do that, but I'm open to hear your opinion. Um, focusing what, what a person uh, had, what you should do in life is, 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 the Venn diagram of what you're good at, what you would like to do, and what is um, is contributing to society, or in this case, uh, the company as a proxy for that. And uh, having those conversations is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you guys both are good at that, I assume. I think, I, I, think, I think I'm good at, at having that conversation, uh, like, like structuring the conversation. I think he's good at, um, he has, he's one of the lowest ego people I, I've ever met. So he puts the interest of the company ahead of his own interests. Um, so I, uh, that's, that's a really commendable thing and it makes a lot of things a lot easier. And how did you know to come up with that structure and being proactive about these things? Was it intuitive to you or did you learn about this somewhere or did you see a role model or people doing it this way that you knew that this, is, this was really important? Yeah, so if you're referring to the dual career track, which we have in GitLab and, and multiple like people do it, uh, it's, it's, it's a thing in many organizations or it's become more common in engineering organizations, which you don't want is the Peter principle where you kind of the only way for a great engineer to advance is to become a manager. And then you lose a great engineer, you have a bad manager. So some of our engineers success are really great managers. Some of our engineers are contributing an enormous amount of value, but they're not managing is either not uh, what they want or it's the, the appropriate thing wouldn't be the, the skill that they, that they're comfortable with, et cetera, and lots of reasons. And there needs to be an escape valve. Uh, and that escape valve is the dual career track, and that's that's uh, it's expensive, uh, but we think it's really important. Mm -hmm. And um, let's go a little bit the remote work. The whole company is remote right now. Uh, where are most of the employees located? Yeah, so we have a team page. So if you Google GitLab team, you can find a map. Uh, about half is in the U.S., and the other half is spread around like mm -hmm. forty-six different countries. All right. And what are some of the main advantages of having a remote workforce, do you think? I think uh, it forces everyone to focus on output instead of input. So we're very results focused. Um, we, we don't allow managers to, um, to talk about input, like how many hours you put in, unless we're suspecting that someone is working too many hours. Uh, but other than that, the focus should always be on the output. So we don't compete by staying, staying, going to work sooner or staying at work longer or not taking holidays or stuff like that. We, we try to avoid that. We try to give a good example as, as executives taking, taking long holidays. And um, I think the output focus is really important. I think you're f because it's harder to kind of shadow someone and kind of learn from seeing them work, you need to write down more. So we're really good at that and I think in the end that, that creates a lot of efficiency and makes it easier to change things because it's written down so you can change it um, yeah I could I could go on for quite a while but oh, yeah. that's great thank you um, do you have any advice for people just starting up they're just founding their company and they like specific 
advice for them to create a good foundation for their relationship going forward? Um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, it won't be new, but um, make sure you get to know the person before you. Uh, like, just like you did? <laughs> I, I think we got to know each other's work, um, yeah. which helps. And, and I think it's, it's frequently better to kind of fall in love with each other's work and then build a relation based on that than fall in love with the, like pers the person and then try to build a business. Mm -hmm. uh, friendships based on business tend to last longer than businesses based on friendships. Um, another thing is set expectations correctly. Um, like if, if you have three co-founders and it's not clear who's the CEO, that tends to be, that's a problem. That's, that's, that's a big, a big flag of that. that you, you avoid it, a very hard conversation. Um, have vesting. So vest into the company so that if someone needs to be let go, that they don't keep owning like a, a third of the company, even though they worked there only for a year. Uh, to just do the standard vesting, four years, one year cliff. Um, have uh, cadence in, convers in conversations. Like I talk with him every week and it's like my, my easiest agenda. Like we, you, you could like easily think, ah, oh, I'll just skip that call. And look, it's a special relationship and you should invest in it. And co-founder co conflict is a big problem in many com companies. Um, so... Um, make sure you spend the time and it's great if there's not a big agenda because there's more time for informal things that come up and that, that, ten, that can be sometimes the most important things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and have those conversations. A great book if you want to read it, uh, Crucial Conversations. But, and blame-free, open, sharing conversations about, about hearts, the hard subjects. Great. Thank you, Sid. This was great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching, everyone.